everybody, it's wonderful to be back with you. I was away last week on our youth mission trip. We had a phenomenal week ministering to the people of our community. We have a lot of pictures and stories and stuff that we'll be sharing here over the next couple of weeks. So uh, thank you for bearing with me while I was away. It's good to be back with you as we study First Peter together. Today we're going to be in First Peter chapter 3 looking at verses 8 to 22. Well, if you remember, Peter is writing to uh, the these persecuted Christians that are scattered throughout Asia Minor, uh, and they are going through uh, a time of intense persecution. And it's in light of that that, that Peter really writes what he writes here in chapter 3, uh, because it is one thing to believe in something, uh, but persecution and suffering, and that's what he's going to talk a lot about here in these verses, suffering moves us from belief to conviction. Belief is something that we accept, truth that we accept. Conviction is something else. It is belief that is lived out. It is belief that moves you to action. Somebody put it this way. They said, belief is what you argue about. Conviction is what you die for. So today we're going to look at the topic of living a life of conviction because the things that Peter writes about in these verses aren't, aren't simply aren't just simple acts of belief. They are, they are things that we need to be convicted about if we are going to live these truths out in our lives. Well, he starts in verses 8 and 12 by talking about how conviction leads to compassion. So if you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Peter. We're going to be in chapter 3. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 8 to 22 today, but we're going to start out on verses 8 to 12. And here's what God's Word has to say. Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil for evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love this life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Peter starts this section now by talking by talking about being like-minded, being sympath sympathetic, to love one another and be compassionate and humble. This idea that when we have true conviction, it leads to compassion in our lives. And there's no better example of this than Jesus. In fact, I want to give you a little homework assignment this week. I want to I want you to look up Jesus and compassion. In fact, uh three of the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all, all tell us that at various points in his ministry, Jesus had compassion. Sometimes it was for an individual, sometimes it was for a crowd. And what you'll find in those passages, and I, I want to invite you to find these passages for yourself, is to go look those up because there's always another word that's connected with that word compassion. It's the word and. In other words, Jesus doesn't just have compassion and that's the end of the story. The compassion always led Jesus to action. And this is what happens when we are convicted, fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. We don't just have compassion. That compassion moves us to action. When we see something that is not right in the eyes of God, we don't just keep walking. That was the story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan had genuine compassion because he saw the person and did something about it. There's that end again. He stopped and he made it right. And this is exactly what we see with Jesus over and over again. He doesn't just have compassion and then move on with his life. He has compassion and stops what he's doing to go try to fix the problem. Interestingly enough, if you look it up in a thesaurus, the opposite of compassion is indifference. And it's literally what we see from the two people before the Good Samaritan. They are indifferent. They see the suffering and they justify reasons not to be involved. They justify reasons to keep on moving. Conviction to what God says here leads us to stop. It leads us to move 
in the way of reconciliation. As a pastor, I, I, I've seen much material throughout my years about evangelism, and I am still con- convinced that compassion is the greatest form of evangelism that we have. If we want people to care about our theology, we need to care about them. Jesus understood this. Jesus' theology was very different from the teachers of the law. It was very different from the world around him. He taught countercultural things. Why did people stay and listen? Why did they say, well, why didn't they say, well, this guy's crazy. This guy's out and right. Why? Because Jesus was filled with compassion. Genuinely compassionate followers of Jesus Christ are, are followers of Jesus Christ who can share the truth that they know because people will actually listen. Well, conviction leads to other things as well. In verses 13 to 17, we read that conviction leads to good. It's interesting here in these verses, and we'll get to them in just a second, uh, but but so so much of what we do is based on the reaction that we get out of people. If we do something and we get a good reaction, what do we do? We usually keep doing it because we like the reaction. And if we do something uh, and it doesn't get the, a good reaction or we get a negative reaction, what do we usually do? We usually stop. But what's interesting uh, is, is when we're truly convicted, when we truly believe in something, what happens next really doesn't matter. And that's exactly what, what Peter writes here in verses 13 to 17. Let's look at this together. He says, who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience so those who speak maliciously against you against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. These these verses are interesting because they're they're saying exactly what we what we just talked about. Um, it, we we see that in these verses there there's a real clear line between being convicted and being good. What 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 Peter is saying here is, listen, when we are convicted to do what's right, whether whether people receive it, and most of the time they will. When you're doing good for other people, most people are pretty happy with that. But sometimes we do the right thing and we're chastised for it. We're mocked for it. Uh, and frankly, in uh, to the to the Christians that he's writing to in this letter, they are being physically persecuted for doing good. But the point that Peter makes here is this. He says, look. It doesn't matter if you're if you're doing good and receiving good, which you usually will, or if you do good and they want to take your lives. If this is your genuine conviction, you keep doing what is right. Whether good or bad is the response from the people around us. It doesn't change our motivation. We are followers of Christ. We're not followers of this world. And that's exactly what we find in that's exactly what we find in Romans chapter 12 verses 1 to 2. Paul writes this, "Therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind." Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. In other words, what is, what is Paul saying here? He says, we do good no matter what the response is. We're not, we're not conforming to this world. We're not trying to fit in here. We are doing what God calls us to do. And most of the time when we do what God calls us to do, because God calls us to do things like love and show compassion and care for those in needs, these are things that frankly are applauded in our culture. But sometimes they're not. Sometimes sometimes people question our motives and our reasons. And it says, well, no matter what they do, whether they praise you or whether they curse you, because it's your conviction, because it's what you not just believe, but you believe and live out. 
it doesn't change what you do. I've watched a lot of sports movies over the years, and uh, sports movies, there's gen- generally a lot of conviction. There's someone out there like Rudy or, or, or someone like that, Rocky, who says, I'm going to win no matter what. And, and this movie usually is built on this person who is an underdog, and they have this unbelievable conviction. Now, there's people out there that are like, yeah, you do it, Rock, you can do it. And then there's people that say, you know what, Rocky, don't even get in that ring. You're going to get pummeled. But what do they do in, in these movies? Whether it's a walk-on at Notre Dame or whether it's a boxer, they climb into that ring. Why? Because it doesn't matter what the people around them say. They are wholeheartedly convinced that they are right. Well, in these sports movies, they're kind of, they're kind of counting on themselves. We count on something much greater than ourselves. An almighty God who has told us and shown us the way that we should do it. Well, that leads us right into uh, the last section that Peter writes about. That conviction leads us to Christ. Look what these verses say. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with the angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Peter, uh, Peter gives a section. He, Peter tends to come back to what he knows best. And what, is, what does Peter know best? Maybe, maybe as much as anyone, he knows Jesus Christ. Genuine conviction leads us to Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. Did Jesus Christ have conviction? Yeah, absolutely. We're studying Matthew on Sunday mornings, and we see very clear, even when everyone around him did not understand, Jesus was utterly convinced and convicted of what he was going to do. It led his actions. It wasn't just some cognitive cog- a cognitive uh, game he was going through. It was what he set his heart and his mind on. This is what Peter comes back to. He says, if you have any question about what conviction looks like, look at Jesus Christ. Because he didn't just believe these things, he continually lived them out, even to the point of death on a cross. Sometimes we, we, sometimes we have struggle when we try to do the right thing and good doesn't come out of it, or we don't get the results that we want I, and interestingly enough, we actually had this conversation on the missions trip one night. Uh, we were talking about the idea of what happens when bad things happen to good people. And and so often in the Bible, whether it was in the book of Job or even Jesus with his disciples, when they asked him about a man who was born blind, there's this idea that, hey, these bad things happened because this person wasn't right with God. And And certainly there is consequence to sin. Uh, and many times we bring upon, bring upon ourselves difficulty be- directly as a result of our sin. But the Bible makes it clear over and over again that bad things happening to us, difficulty in this life, is not necessarily connected to disobe- disobeying Jesus Christ. And, and there's no other place that we see this more obvious than in Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ is beaten He is mocked, he is betrayed, he is hung on a cross to die. Who did he sin against? Well, no one. (laughs) And if difficulty comes into the life of Christ, who did and said everything perfectly, isn't it right to understand that sometimes that's going to happen to us as well, his followers? This was, uh, for some of the kids on our mission trip, this was was an eye-opening thought. That, hey, if Jesus could suffer and he did nothing wrong, then it stands to reason sometimes when people question us or get upset at us, 
Well, they did this to Jesus. So why wouldn't they also do that to us? I want before we finish the se- section, I, I do want to make one little note uh, on this on this passage about Noah because there's a lot of confusion uh, about this, uh, and, and uh, truthfully, it's a, an ambiguously written section. Uh, but but it says this in verse 19: After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. Now, there's been a couple different interpretations of this. Some some have taken this to to say that uh, Jesus descended into hell and preached to the people that were in hell. Uh, There's a couple different views about uh, the sons of men that we find in Genesis chapter 12. But to be honest, we don't really see anything else in the entirety of the Bible that, that kind of gives any background uh, to, to those teachings. But what is interesting, in verse 19, it says, after being made alive, that interpretation could be, uh, be uh, understood to say, to be made alive in the Spirit. In other words, the Spirit of Christ, also known as the Holy Spirit. Uh, it says that he made proclamation to the imprisoned spirit. In other words, and, and Peter uses Noah again later on as and, and gives him uh, the name, uh, talks about Noah as a preacher of righteousness. In other words, and we do know this from the Old Testament, that there were times when the spirit of God came on people to give them specific jobs. So I, I, I think what's happening here, and, and this seems very consistent with what we're reading about uh, and, and the argument that Peter is making, uh, Noah was a man who was clearly being persecuted for doing what God had told him to do, which is exactly what, frankly, Peter is talking about and exactly the context of who he's writing to. In other words, he's saying to these people, look at Noah. Noah was a person who was doing what God asked him to do. He had conviction He was mocked for doing what was right, but what did he continue to do? Through the Spirit of God, he continued to witness and do what was right. I think think that interpretation, uh, when when you look at it in the Greek, one, makes sense, and two, fits the context of the passage. All these other ones, it's kind of frankly, really out in left field, and you really got to do a lot of hermeneutical uh, gymnastics to kind of wedge it in here. It's interesting stuff, but the clearest interpretation is that that, uh, Peter is talking about Noah as an example of what these people in Asia Minor are going through. Noah went through the same stuff that you're going through. Be convicted, follow God, and continue to share the good news. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you for uh, hanging in there while I was away for a week. Um, I, I hope you've enjoyed these uh, studies of First Peter. We'll be right back to it next week. Uh, we'll start First Peter chapter 4. Uh, thank you for joining us, and God bless.